When I first played Resident Evil 8, I thought that it was pretty great. I wasn't sure how to articulate, so I decided to reinvestigate before I create. Not to invalidate or agitate those who thought the game's positive fate was accurate, but I'm here to participate in the cultural climate with my take on the game's state. I'll try to truncate my hate, but I refuse to misappropriate. And I'm done, we're not doing that anymore. As a diehard Resident Evil fan, Resident Evil 8 had me hyped ever since I heard about it, especially since it followed in the footsteps of Resident Evil 7's playstyle, which, while I heavily enjoyed it, it had some very clear issues that seemed like it would be easily fixed in the next iteration. And for the most part, that happened. But then it kinda kept going, and it went off the rails through feature creep, and the end result became a complex mess to talk about. And this isn't even going to be the video where I really lay into it. As I did with the Resident Evil 3 remake, this video is going to be more of a brief summary of my experience. Except this time, I played through the game four times and I 100%ed it. I'm doing a Resident Evil retrospective where I go in depth to each game in the franchise, but I'm doing that in order, so we got a long wait until we actually get here again. Consider this a test run, so if I'm exceptionally wrong and stupid and ugly about something, let me know in the comment section below so I can correct myself in the full video. The first thing I'd like to bring up is just how terrible the name of the game itself is. Resident Evil Village seems like a placeholder, or like they were really desperate to fit in that VIII. -I -I. Yeah, it sounds stupid, but let's see you come up with a better title with those letters. Not a lot of options. Now, what do I even call it? What do I call it in this video? Resident Evil 8? Resident Evil Village? Resident Evil 8 Village? I don't like it. Now, moving on to, like, actual criticism, Resident Evil 8 takes the gameplay style that was established in Resident Evil 7 while mixing in a bit of action gameplay from Resident Evil 4, which should be exciting considering that was arguably the best entry in the franchise. It, it's me. I'm arguing that. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? You can buy upgrades for weapons and collect treasures to sell for cash. There's a weird but friendly merchant that assists you. And there is considerably more combat scenarios, which are very reminiscent of Resident Evil 4. Specifically this area in the beginning where you're trying to fight off a giant horde of large hairy men. So is Resident Evil 8 better than 7? Yeah, but it introduces its own problems. Resident Evil 3 Remake had this problem too, where it wants to be two different opposing genres by mixing the two together, and it ends up making both sides worse. Resident Evil needs to figure out exactly what it's trying to do. If it wants to be an action horror, be an action horror. If it wants to be a survival horror, be survival horror, but you can't be both. Almost every reward for exploring is met with treasure, and if you go as far as to complete all the optional secrets as well as save your resources as is expected from a survival horror game, you will be completely flush with cash, with very little to spend on things that aren't completely useless. I don't care what you say, I'm not upgrading the rate of fire, nobody fucking needs to shoot faster when I need to save my ammunition. I really have no idea why they carried over the cash upgrade since I was never even close to filling up the thing at any point on my first playthrough. The ease of resource management transfers into the ammo resources because you can buy ammo at all times on top of the fat stacks of bullets that you'll be carrying if you play with the frugality expected of the genre. The key element to survival horror, resource management, is incredibly limp here. A large portion of the enemies that are prison are incredibly easy to kill because they're super slow and they have really long wind-ups to their attacks. If I can just blow everything away through attrition, then the survival horror part of the game suffers greatly. It also doesn't help that each area is incredibly limited in how much you can explore once you're done. The castle in particular is notable because once you finish it, you just can't go back. When you've finished everything, it becomes incredibly obvious just how linear this game is because there is very little backtracking for secrets, except the final area, which is basically just backtracking. That's all it is. It's just constant backtracking. For the areas you do backtrack to, there is very little satisfaction in doing so. As usually, the process just involves finding a location on your map and then using a basic tool that you got in one section of the game and then using it on every single subsequent copy-pasted area. It's just find secret number 14 and use item them there. There's no puzzle to it, there's no thinking involved, it's just, hey, there's a well, it needs a well will, times 10. And boom, you got yourself a new item or a treasure at basically no cost to you besides your time. It really feels like they didn't utilize the tools or the areas that they were given. Then on the combat side, the gunplay and the enemy variety and usage ends up being very limited as well. Most enemies are slow and they have no ranged attack, and you rarely find more than one enemy type in a room at once. 
Once grabbed, you'll have to endure a lengthy damage animation, and these really begin to pile up, especially when I'm playing the game for the fourth time and I already know what it looks like to be grabbed. Why can't I just be hit? Why can't you just hit me with an axe or something and I'm like, oof, ow, that hurts, and then boom, we're done. I can shoot you in the face. Why do I have to sit through this animation? What makes it worse is that whenever you trigger an animation, you get pulled in like a magnet and there's nothing you can do. This is where in a survival horror game you'd probably have like an item resource that you could use to get out of the situation real quick at the cost of losing an item that was important to you. Or even in an action game you'd just mash some buttons so that way you could get out faster and take less damage. Considering Resident Evil 7 had the same problem it's really disappointing that they didn't fix it in some way. There's also an unfortunate number of areas where you can just kite enemies after you and then pass an invisible threshold where they go, whoops, that's out of my programming bounds, better turn back, while I unload a dozen magnum rounds into the back of their head. This is the level design of a survival horror game, where enemies have set areas of aggression and are slow and grabby, but because the enemies are so pathetic, I can take them out with minimal effort or ammo. I mean, have you tried to take out these flying enemies with a knife? It probably isn't most people's first instinct, but you can stunlock hordes of these guys with just a knife and maybe get hit once. Hmm, me thinks my extremely prudent playstyle was not accounted for. And all of these issues are things that occurred to me on my very first playthrough. I bring up specifically the first playthrough because this game carried over an incredibly detrimental design from Resident Evil 7. One where the game is meant to be played in one specific way and has barely even accounted for replays. This is why I still think there is some genuine quality on display in Resident Evil 8. The first playthrough can be a blast, pretty much everybody seems to feel that way, but most players and reviews choose to only play a game once before jumping to conclusions. There are certain areas in this game that are absolutely exciting on the first run, but on in subsequent ones, they become a downright chore to play again. The second area you explore, the Beneviento House, actually seems to be a fan favorite due to it being the most horror game-like area. But all that tells me is that all these news outlets did not play the game multiple times or really take in just how shallow the gameplay is or how little development we get from the villain here during this segment. It's just, oh, spooky monster, 10 out of 10, my favorite. Oh, there's so much walking in this game. So many scripted sequences where the player has absolutely nothing to do during them. The most you get out of it is absorbing the story that's being told to you, but once you've already played through the game once, you gain absolutely nothing from playing these again. They're glorified cutscenes, and in most games, you can skip cutscenes, but for some reason you can't do it here. Resident Evil 7 had this problem too, but at least on harder difficulties, the items and enemies were remixed, and the super weapons you carried over were mostly limited to the Super Albert handgun, so it mostly felt like a new experience. Here though, you can carry over all of your infinite ammo weapons, even the ones that can completely break the game, and the only change to enemies is that they get a fucking shitload of health. The point I'm trying to make here is, if you played through the game once already, just imagine playing through it again. Imagine all of the time lost to just walking, to solving puzzles you already know the answer to, to pressing buttons for no good reason, to all the empty threats that you know can't hurt you and only exist for the spectacle alone. This may sound like a bit of a nitpick cause, I mean, who plays games more than once nowadays? Well, Resident Resident Evil is kind of known for having high replayability. When a new Resident Evil game comes out, we hear people complain about the game's length, but the correct answer is always, well, Resident Evil games have always been short because they focus on concisely designed replayability, and that's heavily affected here. Some might say I'm just bitter about playing the game four times for this video. <clears throat> Then there's the mercenary mode that you get for beating the game. I guess the title of The Mercenaries went over Capcom's head because it kind of implies that there is more than one. No, here you just play as Ethan Winters across four levels that get repeated. Some of these areas require you to take very specific and unclear paths in order to get the perfect score, specifically the factory level which I've heard absolutely nothing good about. But the biggest disappointment about this game mode is just how each difficulty plays. Okay, so here's how to beat every easy version version of the level. Sell your handgun and buy the most expensive shotgun. Congrats, you win. It one shot kills pretty much every enemy and you're constantly finding ammunition for it. So surviving is just mindless and it takes no skill. From that point on, all you need to know are the enemy spawns to get a perfect rank. And that's more just trial and error. It's incredibly disappointing. Then you unlock the hard versions of the levels and their idea for making something hard is just giving you a pistol as your main weapon for the whole level. If you can properly avoid enemies, then this still isn't very hard. It's just long and boring. 
Just because it takes a long time to put down enemies with handgun bullets does not mean that it's hard. It just eats up my fucking time. But wait, you like the tofu level in Resident Evil 2! Yeah, because that was built around evasion, not killing every enemy with an incredibly weak weapon. Oh, but hey, if you get an SS rank on everything, you at least get to unlock a Darth Maul lightsaber. Too bad that melee in this game is hampered by those constant long grab animations that just pull you in, and a lack of depth perception for sword swings. Oh, and while we're on the note of bad in-game rewards, you know what you get for completing the game on the hardest difficulty? Uh, an infinite rocket launcher or a laser cannon, or something crazy like that. No, you get a measly rocket pistol that does less damage than the grenade launcher. This is some of the weakest in-game rewards in a Resident Evil game, and my disappointment is immeasurable. But there is plenty that I feel positively carried over through other playthroughs, though. Maybe I'm just biased because I love gloomy, overcast skies and snowy environments, but areas like the inside of the castle look great as well. Both characters and enemies look great in every regard, whether they're supposed to look really Eagle, intimidating, or gross. The final factory level is a real standout example of this. I'm always just absolutely bewildered when I see so much machinery and such on the walls. So much attention to detail. Just wow. I'd also argue that Resident Evil 8 took a bit of a step up from Resident Evil 7 by having four unique characters with interesting personalities and themes no you don't count. Resident Evil 7's Baker family were great, but they all sort of share the same general personality of crazy hillbilly, while looking relatively human. But here we got four villains, each with distinct designs that reflect what is supposed to be Victorian monsters, but I see it more like the Universal Monster movies. You got the big vampire mommy that everybody made a funny meme about on the internet. Boy, isn't she sexy? Please step on me, mommy dearest. And her rambunctious triplets, which are bug girls for some reason. A creature from the Black Lagoon Fishman. A doll lady that is supposed to be a ghost or something. And a man that dresses like Van Helsing, acts like Frankenstein, talks like Nicolas Cage, and has fucking magneto powers. Jesus Christ, they're just throwing everything against the wall and I fucking love it. Lady, supersized bitch, ugly ass psycho doll, and then we're like freak. Don't you get it? It's a test to see if you're strong enough to be a part of Miranda's family. I don't want to be a part of Miranda's family. Neither did I, but here we are! Unfortunately, this also comes with a downside. If you got more characters, you get less time devoted to them, especially since Resident Evil games are notoriously short. I couldn't tell you a single thing about Donna Beneviento and her crazy murder doll's personality. We only sort of talk to her once, and it's not even really her, it's more like her doll? So I don't know if that counts? Like, Oh, and while we're talking about a lack of personality, you play as Ethan Winters, whose character is summed up here as, I love my baby. Every scene where he's not trying to find his missing child, he's just making very obvious remarks. It's dark. Dead body? Wait, there's more. Or he's telling extremely lame one-liners with no sense of self-awareness at all. You're the one who's cursed. Leon in Resident Evil 4 had good one-liners, but these just feel, well, weak. And because they're played so genuinely, I have trouble playing them off as camp. Ethan even gets this whole trippy nightmare sequence in the previously mentioned Beneviento house, where in a good game it would reflect the character's personality and attack when where he's weakest as he has to overcome his inner demons and, you know, all that stuff. But here, it ends up reflecting on other characters' pains and fear more than his own. What the hell is this? Everyone leaves me. Even Rose. I don't want to be alone. The deepest you could get out of this is, Ethan feels bad when others feel bad. There's absolutely nothing interesting going on about this character. W w what's that? You love your family? So what, you think you're fucking special? I love my family, where's my video game where I suffer severe hand damage every few seconds? <laughs> And this is where I really need to talk about the story, because oh, 
boy! It's a trash fire! Resident Evil stories have never been good, but I honestly believe that it's never been this noticeably bad. Like, very, very clear plot holes and jumps of logic that actually affect the story, and which have no sign of self-awareness or comedic intent. You, you can't call it camp this time, it's really trying to be serious. You're supposed to be emotionally invested at this point, and it just does not work. It's gonna require complete dissection once I get to it in the retrospective, but for now I'm just gonna hit the bullet points. But here's your spoiler warning if you're one of the confusing, unfortunate souls that care about Resident Evil story. Uh, three, two, one, here we go. Chris is so stupid, oh my god! The trailers set him up as if he's supposed to be some kind of villain in this game, which I'd figure anybody with a brain would be able to see right through. Capcom doesn't have the balls to turn one of its most popular characters into a bad guy. And that's exactly what they did, they, they copped out at the last second. But in order to get those tasty 20 minute trailer speculation videos, they have to make Chris the most obtuse and aggressive idiot ever. Lady Miranda, the main villain of this game, has shape-shifting powers and has taken the place of Ethan's wife in order to get close to his child, Rose. Chris knows this, but he doesn't know who he can trust because Ethan and his daughter might be infected. So what does he do? Does he confront Ethan and tell him everything so he doesn't freak out about this sudden invasion and kidnapping? No, instead he chooses to riddle his wife with bullets, steal his daughter, and leave by saying nothing more than, Ethan, no. What is this supposed to do exactly? Sure, if you told Ethan, then he'd probably want to help find his missing wife, but by not telling Ethan, he's just gonna hold a vendetta against you, Chris, and still be involved. You could have easily told him all of this information at any point during the home invasion. And then, even after seeing how far Ethan will go to save his daughter and how effective he seems to be at doing it with Chris just sitting around with his thumb up his ass, I guess, I don't know. You still tell him nothing? It's too late, man, he's involved! Why are you fucking with him like that? Gee whiz, it's almost like this entire plotline was created to produce artificial tension through trailer buzz! Also, Chris shoots up Miranda, but she fakes being a corpse and manages to break out of the vehicle carrying her. Chris, you have been fighting B.O.W.s for years, including the mold! Chris, you know how dangerous this particular creature is. Why do you think she would be killed after that? You know how this stuff works. You should be on full scorched earth mode with her, or at the very least, have an incredibly secure transportation material to move her from one spot to another, not a fucking truck with no defenses on it. Why are you so stupid, Chris? This entire game wouldn't happen if you were just written competently. The last thing to discuss in this heavily shortened story critique is the big twist at the end that Ethan died in Resident Evil 7 and is now just a moldman that thinks and acts like Ethan. Which seems like such a bizarre afterthought to explain why Ethan has crazy regenerative powers and can take so much abuse. It's really weak in terms of the character development that goes into it because really it's more just excusing the things that happened in previous games as well as explaining why he did not die in certain situations in this game, but it does absolutely nothing for Ethan's character. Compare this to another game, a game called Prototype, which also did the virus is a man but he thinks is a human kind of story. The entire story in that game involved Alex Mercer trying to figure out his identity and then moving on from it deciding whether or not he wanted to be the same person that died or not. I looked for the truth. Found it. Didn't like it. Wish the hell I could forget it. Alex Mercer. The city suffered for his mistakes. For what he did at Penn Station. Ethan's just like, I'm Moldman, okay, now I'm dead, the end. And everything about this ending raises questions. Like, why is Ethan apparently the only mold man that didn't go crazy or turn into a monster? Why didn't his wife turn into a mold woman in Resident Evil 7? Why are mold people apparently able to reproduce with human women? Why did nobody detect that Ethan was a mold man after the events of Resident Evil 7? You would think Chris would have Ethan take like hundreds of tests to see if anything was wrong with him. Why would Mia keep this a secret from literally everyone including Ethan? And how did she know this before Chris? 
Wouldn't anybody be able to detect his moldness, especially other people connected to the mold? Vampire Mommy does have an offhand remark about how his blood is stale at one point, but that feels really inconsequential. Oh, and we aren't even done here yet, folks. It gets dumber after Miranda rips Ethan's heart out and he somehow recovers. If Ethan can recover from having a vital organ torn out of his body, how is there any death state whatsoever in this game? If Ethan can recover a fucking heart, how come he can't recover his fingers that he loses at the very beginning of the game? What causes him to die at the very end, especially since he won the fight against Miranda and has no visible wounds on his body? Why did Miranda's ritual not turn Rose into her dead daughter? And why did she even lose power to begin with? How did Chris manage to escape on a plane within the 10 seconds it took Ethan to activate the bomb that would supposedly blow up the entire town? Chris can punch boulders! How can he not carry both Rose and Ethan out on his shoulders? Why do I have to make a million different assumptions in order for this plot to make any kind of sense? The story is asinine. There are plenty of really stupid things I'm willing to accept, like a fungus somehow granting a man magneto powers, but this stuff is just leaps in logic based on what we know about the characters and their abilities. How am I supposed to feel sad for a hunk of wood character when nothing about his story makes sense and I don't care about him? Resident Evil 8 is a dumb game, but you know what? It can be enjoyed for what it is especially on the first playthrough. Unfortunately, I'm not reviewing this game based on my first impressions like uh, all the other review outlets. I'm reviewing after taking into account everything I learned after playing the game four times. I'd still recommend playing it once though, for sure, but any more will suffer greatly from diminishing returns. I swear to God, if I have to play the Beneviento house one more time, I will puke from anger. The problems with this game really do go deeper, but I'm saving that for the retrospective. In the end, I don't really know what else to do than call this game a disappointment. I had fun, for sure, but that doesn't excuse this incredibly lackluster survival horror and action elements that turn the game into a fairly mediocrely crafted product. Play the game once, you will have a good time, and I'll probably just sound like a fucking raving cynic like a lot of the people who are watching this already think. It isn't the biggest train wreck, and not even the worst Resident Evil, but it really does suffer from a ton of small problems that add up. My current score for Resident Evil 8 is a 6.5 out of 10. And I can't wait to see you all 10 years from now when I give this game the full analysis. Or, you know, at the Ari-verse review. <laughs>